Hello, everybody, and this is What is Truth, Part 82. I'm John Barnwell in the city of Detroit, Detroit, the Straits, and I'm here with the wonderful prelate, Reverend David William Perry. For those of you that don't know, a prelate is, is a, a, a church official that is a monsignor or a bishop or a cardinal or whatever. It's, it's uh, honorific. So let's honor our friend here that represents the thoughts we hold dear. And being that the festival of Pentecost is the point of Christianity. You know, the turning point in time is the crucifixion, according to Rudolf Steiner. And here we have several festivals that, that play into the cosmic aspect of this drama of mankind that we all share. We all share that because we all have an individual ego that that is that principle that reincarnates so that it can experience karma. And as Rudolf Steiner had shared that Christ is now, since entering into earth evolution at the baptism and going through the mystery of Golgotha and the following mysteries, that he is now the new Lord of karma. And so that when we go to the gate of death, uh, it's nice to know that uh, if we so choose, we can meet him at the threshold and not Lucifer. And uh, it's a different path, shall we say. And so in getting into this, um, I... I've been thinking about certain ideas that uh, would be most helpful. And uh, so that the first thing I could share is uh, from Dornach on June 4th, 1924, from the uh, collection of lectures, festivals and their meaning. It's uh, the Whitson Festival. It's place in the study of karma. And for those that are Americans that don't know, well, what's a Whitson? Well, that's that has to do with Pentecost. That's the British uh, form. And, uh, of course, in Britain in, what, 1971, they converted Whitson Festival into a bank holiday. And so, uh, but today's Sunday, so the banks wouldn't be open anyway. So that, what, they close them tomorrow? Is that how they're going to do it? But uh, in any event... Let's let's try and look at the real world rather than the one that they're trying to make us believe. And so in this uh, lecture of uh, June 4th, 1924, Rudolf Steiner says, when we consider how karma works, we always have to bear in mind that the human ego, which is the essential being, the inmost being of man, has, as it were, three instruments through which he's able to live and express himself in the world. These are the physical body, the etheric body, and the astral body. Man really carries the physical, etheric, and astral bodies with him through the world. But he himself is not any one of these bodies. In the truest sense, he is the ego. And it's the ego which both suffers and creates karma. Now the point is to gain an understanding of the relationship between man as the ego being and these three instrumental forms, if I may call them so, the physical, etheric, and astral bodies. This will give us a foundation for an understanding of the essence of karma. We shall gain a fruitful point of view for the study of the physical, etheric, and the astral in man in relation to karma, if we consider the following. 
the physical as we behold it in the mineral kingdom, the etheric as we find it working in the plant kingdom, and the astral as we find it working in the animal kingdom. All of these are found in the environment of man here on earth, in the cosmos surrounding the earth. We have that universe into which, if I may so describe it, the earth extends on all sides. Man can feel a certain relationship between what takes place on the earth and what takes place in the cosmic environment. But when we come to spiritual science, we have to ask, this relationship really is so commonplace as the present-day scientific conception of the world imagines. This modern scientific conception of the world examines the physical qualities of everything on earth living and lifeless. It also investigates the stars, the sun, the moon, etc., and it discovers, indeed, it is particularly proud of the discovery that these heavenly bodies are fundamentally of the same nature as the earth. Such a conception can only result from a form of knowledge which at no point comes to a real grasp of man himself, a knowledge which takes hold only of what is external to man. The moment, however, we really take hold of man as he stands within the universe, we become able to discover the relationship between the several instrumental members of man's nature, the physical body, the etheric body, the astral body, and the corresponding entities, corresponding realities of being in the cosmos. And so forgive me for sharing an extensive quotation, but if you don't have those ideas, you can't really enter into a spiritual scientific understanding of the festival of Pentecost or Whitson. Reverend David, how are you, sir? Uh, always lovely seeing you, John. A happy Whitson Sunday, as they say here. Um, yeah, I mean, I've managed to survive the Platinum Jubilee, um, which hasn't been the easiest thing in the world. So we've had a very, very long weekend. Um, the Queen, in her munificence, uh, gifted us all, us peasants, a day off. Um, and there was also the Whitson Bank holiday. Uh, sadly, yes, reduced to a bank holiday. So everyone's been getting drunk basically since Thursday um, and they're all back to work tomorrow so what de depresses me equally not not just the fact that we're being reduced to me there's something drunk. going on with your sound it's like kind of chattering a little bit oh I've absolutely no idea what's going on yeah is that the answer? yeah Os Oswald is pointing it out also the audio is, audio is very fuzzy on, on your, what we're hearing. Right. Is that any better? Yeah. I don't know what you did, but that's better. Uh, I'll have to hold it. I'll have to hold it instead of partition it. So you got a, a bad uh, bad jack on there or something like that? Is it okay now? Yeah, it's okay now. Right. Okay. Thank you, Oswald. Uh, Thank you, John. So, yeah, I mean... What depresses me, apart from the rampant materialism um, and the fact, as uh, you know, I agree with you 100%, we're having a false reality basically superimposed over all of us. What depresses me, I suppose, is the fact that people live up to medieval stereotypes in this part of the world. You know, you've got the landed gentry have, holding court, literally, in this case, and having you know soldiers playing the music whereas the peasantry just go and get pissed uh, for four days. I'm not going to gloss it over with a pleasant term. Do you know, I, when I was a student, we knew how to drink. We'd go out and we'd have a very healthy thirst to us. And what was the difference? We spoke about literature. We spoke about art. We had huge arguments over ideologies and politics and systems. That is not what is going on now. They go out and they want to get pissed. So I'm not I'm not glossing it over with a, a more pleasant term because that's all it is. And um, I saw something on 
sadly on TikTok, yes, I'm addicted to TikTok. I'm sorry. I've got a very healthy account on TikTok. Um, where are all these young guys, British guys, with a, a, a young a young gentleman who was slightly overweight? At my age, it's forgivable, dear. At your age, it's not forgivable. Okay. Um, so, and they were all all shouting a fat bastard at him. And his way of getting back into the magical circle of confres was to drink what I assume was beer, a God alone, a sort of, you know, one of these McDonald's containers uh, of a liquid, which we were led to believe was beer, but maybe not, which he drank in one go and then literally fell over some plastic seats onto the floor with everybody cheering. So when, when I was a student and we had a healthy thirst, I've done some fair falling over in my time under a table, but it was normally well, well shouting about the, the, the rights and wrongs of Marcel Proust at the same time, as opposed to just getting drunk. Um, you know, I, I just find the whole thing deeply depressing. And we're all going back fitted into medieval stereotypes where the elite feel completely justified in keeping uh, us evil demos, you know, the, 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 the serfdom under control. I mean, look at what they're like. You've got to keep them under control. Um, so, yeah, utterly, utterly, utterly depressing. The only good bit of news was, as um, was it Westminster Abbey? I can't remember. As Boris Johnson turned up to one of the royal occasions, there was so much booing, he actually looked shocked and speeded his entry into the holy place. So that cheered me up a bit. Um, no, I mean, you know, they're, they're packaging the Queen. Right, so I've got two attitudes. I'm not the biggest monarchist in the world, as I think people who know me realise. Um, so let, let's, let's all stop arguing about that. She's done a competent job for head of state. OK, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, she's, <clears throat> she's in her 90s. And the old Queen deserves a bit of respect. Already I'm quailing a bit, but I'll, I'll meet you all halfway. I'll say those things. What I will say is, why do we need a monarchy after this one? I mean, she's, Charles is not lovable. Let's face it, bit of an old hippie, but not lovable. Why do we need this political charade to continue when Elizabeth finally goes to glory? I would say we don't. Um, so that that's basically my... My take on all of this, um, some good camera angles, uh, you know, uni union flags everywhere, a um, bit prettier than usual. Though I notice they've all kept their hands in their pockets. I mean, it's meant to be a platinum jubilee, not some mild, you know, a unique achievement, I'm told, for a, for a British monarch. Um, you know, so have a bit of pizzazz, but nobody wants to spend any money. You know, Elton John, Sir Elton didn't turn up in person but, but had, you know, had a presentation done on his behalf. He beamed something through. The red arrows of the RAF had to call off play today because of the because of the weather conditions. Sorry, aren't you trained military experts? They'd never say that in Top Gun. You know, so they called off their fly past. I mean, God, what a shower this country's turning into. Um, you know, it's this. It's all so tinny and third class and third rate and. The rich don't want to spend anything. Then don't put on these charades and make us an international joke to the entire planet. So that's how I'm feeling today. Um, I, I, no, I don't think, you know, I've got resounding in my ears rule Britannia. You know, this sort of jingoistic nonsense about a, an imperialistic enterprise that enslaved half the planet. No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not at my best, and I'm doing my, my my utmost to push it all to the side. But at least it's wits, and we can celebrate that. The Christ impulse takes many forms. Um, to the apostles back in the days of miracles, it took the forms of tongues of fire, uh, which instantly allowed communication at every level of human being. What what a a miracle of miracles! But the, we, we've got to remember, I suppose, the Christ impulse takes many forms and it adapts I, because it's a living principle. It's not a principle like magnetism or electricity. It's, it's an alive, sentient force, power. 
So it takes many forms across the centuries and in different cultures. And what we've got to do, I think, is, is celebrate the fact that this wonderful energy, this, this glorious spirit is reaching out to all of us all of the time. John. I'll be right back. Oh, oh, no, don't go. I hate that. I hate that. He's done it again. Right. So where do I go from there? Certainly in the anthroposophical materials, I, I like the phrase Christ impulse. I mean, people, again, who know me know I prefer Christ energy or Christ consciousness. I think Christ energy is probably the best because it gives, you know, the impression of something active. It gives the impression uh, 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 you know, I think even Christ consciousness, it's like sort of something like waking up or something, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a passive thing. And that's not the idea of the Christ at all. The Christ is very active. I mean, curiously, it's, it's your Japs, your Japanese that come up with the idea beautifully. Um, I remember watching one of Kurosawa's movies years ago. And uh, uh, was it Ran? I can't quite remember where one of the characters is singing to the Lord Amitabha, the Buddha of infinite light, who reaches out with a 100,000 arms to save everybody. And I thought, well, I feel very at home with that idea. I know what that idea is. Um, and that's the Christ impulse. That's very clearly the Christ impulse. It's not this sort of inert law of nature. It's not this sort of inert presence. Is an active power and energy and force reaching out to the benefit of all. And if that doesn't make people glorify God and realize what a wonderful gift we have in the Savior, I really don't know what will. Back to you, John. Yes, well, going to that uh, whole diatribe you did on the celebration in merry old England with the royals and all of that. You know, it's it, to me, it's kind of a, we're watching reruns of Dynasty. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm sorry, but it's, it's so, it's, it is, it's, it's passe. We've, we've gone beyond that realm uh, as far as the needs of, of our development. There was a, a time in which that type of uh, form in in government and society had a meaningful role, and uh, but since 1879, where we've entered into the age of Michael, to where it it increasingly becomes the individual responsibility for a person to take up the challenge of what essentially is reincarnation and karma and meeting it. And to say that, that one can create some kind of social structure that's uh, this utopia where you'll own nothing and you, you'll be happy and you'll be ruled over by oligarchs or royals or whomsoever's the lucky few, I mean, that's kind of not realistic because of the stage of development of mankind, the, the excess egoism as opposed to the, the ego as a divine principle that was received through the agency of the Logos the Christ, as described in the first 14 verses of the Gospel of John. So when you get into understanding the course of the year as a really a, a representation of this Christ mystery, you see that the, the Christmas festival has to do with that budding life of of the etheric nature coming forth again, because again, it's it's the rebirth of the year also because it's occurring around the winter solstice when the days begin to come longer. So that's moving towards that mystery of life, the etheric nature. Whereas the Easter festival, Rudolf Steiner equates that with the astral 
nature and that's that mystery of death and it at death the astral and ego separate from the etheric body and the physical body initially before the etheric body finally also brings about a separation but there's a certain principle that's referred to in theosophy that's called the causal body and what the causal body represents is and it's uh, visible to somebody who could see auras but that there's this aspect of the physical or of the uh, astral and etheric that have been transformed through a developed relationship to the reincarnating ego and to the extent that you have evolved the there's an increase of this causal body and so just so you have that in mind because that's what you're looking at and Rudolf Steiner says in uh, a symbol, the Whitson Festival, a symbol of the immortality of the ego. And that was in uh, June 6th in Berlin in 1916. He says, turn our minds to thoughts connected with the Whitson Festival. Seems to me less appropriate during these grave days than, I would, than would have been the case during earlier years. Well, they're in World War I, so they're going through some tough times. And I continue, for mankind is passing through fateful ordeals, and at such times it is not really fitting to call up feelings of inner warmth and exhilaration. If our feelings are right and true, we can never for a single moment forget the suffering that is now so universal. And in a certain sense, it is actually selfish to wish to forget it in order to give ourselves up to thoughts that warm and uplift the soul. It will therefore be more fitting today to speak of certain matters bearing on our needs of the age. For our recent studies have shown very clearly that many of the reasons for the sufferings of the present time lie in the prevailing attitude to the spiritual. And that it is virtually that it is vitally urgent to work for the development of the human soul in order that mankind may go forward to better days. Nevertheless, I want to start with thoughts which will bring home to us the meaning of a festival such as Whitson. And so in light of that, you see that the, he's pointing towards meeting the challenge uh, of the realities of, of human karma. And, and since we're going through a trying time with a great deal of, shall we say, dark forces working in the world and working ever, ever so strongly, you have the, the, the serpent of Lucifer and the dragon of Araman or Satan uh, working overtime against mankind to bring about a challenge to the sovereignty of that individual uh, Christ nature that we all share, our individual ego. So it behooves us to be able to come to an understanding of what that might mean. And Rudolf Steiner says later in this lecture, it's only the ego that we do not find revealed in the cosmic environment. Why is this? We shall find the reason if we consider how this human ego manifests here on the earth in a world that is in reality threefold, physical, etheric, and astral. The ego of man as it appears within the universe is ever and again a repetition of former lives on earth. And again and again, it finds itself in the life between death and a new birth. But when we observe the ego in its life between death and a new birth, we perceive that the etheric, which we have here in the cosmic environment of the earth, has no significance for the human ego. The etheric body is laid aside soon after death. It is only the astral world that shines in towards us through the stars that has significance for the ego in the life between death and a new birth. And in that world which glistens in towards us through the stars. In that world there live the beings 
of the higher hierarchies who, with whom man forms his karma between death and a new birth. And so it's being able to develop your understanding of, of what these things actually are because Rudolf Steiner is very clear. And he, of course, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to accept it, but at least uh, give me that you'll attempt to understand what I'm trying to say and that you can maintain a healthy uh, suspension of disbelief, shall we say. Because in coming to a spiritual scientific understanding of, of the development of Earth as being the fourth planetary condition, you have to keep in mind that Rudolf Steiner says, were you to travel off the Earth, the further you got away from Earth, the less the laws of Earth would apply. Well, that's quite a concept. And they're actually, they struggle with that in, in the uh, aerospace uh, branch of, of the governing body, whatever you want to call it, because there's certain things happening that are supportive of that view of reality. And they're starting to see, like, they're, they look at the universe, and the universe looks back at you, really. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But, you know, like the Voyager, once it got beyond the, the ring pass knot, now all of a sudden it, the, its messages are unintelligible. And that's happening around the same time that the supercomputers are now conversing to each other in a language that no human being on earth understands as far as we know although there could be one individual incarnate here araman that understands perfectly well so that you have this whole world of uh, physical laws that that are interpreted from the life of the senses you know the the old uh, metaphor of plato's cave that, that our experience of reality is as if we were looking at our shadow on the wall in a cave from a fire behind us. And so we have to be able to turn around and face the fire. And what is that fire? The fire is that, that uh, primal gift that was received from the leader of the spirits of fire and the old sun evolution. And that's that, that whole idea of the self-sacrificing logos. Whereas Lucifer, the alternative, if you can't take up the Christ principle as a conscious uh, task, then what, what happens is one ends up encountering the fallen spirit of Lucifer, who was also going through a uh, uh, head of the Venus planetary scheme. And so you have, but he fell from that task. And because he's a fallen spirit, we, we do owe him the fact of that we have that individual nature, that we're capable of having an experience of ourselves as separate beings, that we're not just the... You know, automatons of, of the great Godhead that are just automatically always doing the right thing. <clears throat> so we have a choice. And with that choice comes karma. And that's all wrapped up in the mystery of birth and death, which is something that, that takes place between Christmas and Easter. But the, the real point of all of that is to be able to enter into a relationship, a personal relationship to the spirit. And of course, first coming through the realm of the spirit self, which is the realm in, in Christian uh, esotericism is referred to as the Holy Spirit. And so Pentecost is the festival of the Holy Spirit. And it's in the gospel, it says, or in the Acts of the Apostles, it says that the tongues of flame descended upon the heads of the apostles and they were able to speak and anybody would understand them. Well, that they could speak this 
language of all things, the long vert, the language of the birds, the language, there's a lot of different po poetic metaphors for that innate capacity to be able to express the heart forces so effectively within language that it, you create an understanding uh, that is not like hemmed in by conceptual theoretical views of the world. And so there's a universally human aspect to it. And that's the key to understand because just as you have uh, your folk souls all relating to specific entities that are different beings out of the realm of the archangels, the ego principle, the fourth principle of man, is something that was received from the activity of Christ working through the spirits of form. And so it's something that all mankind shares. And it's also something that, that mankind can give up, that you can actually lose your connection uh, to uh, that Christ principle. And so that's the challenge that when you look at the, the Feast of Ascension where he ascends, it's like all of a sudden, hey, wait a minute, where are you going? You know, because I thought you were gonna stick around, you know, and he, he like takes off basically. It's the return through the Holy Spirit in Pentecost that is the fulfillment of the, the, the saying, I shall be with you always. And so there, there is that uh, innate capacity potential in mankind to be able to maintain uh, an intimate relationship with Christ so that when we cross the threshold, it's Christ before us, enabling us to maintain the awareness of this, this entity that is going to be able to pass through time. And so Rudolf Steiner describes it, that Christ gave us back our relationship to time that we had fallen so far into the realm of matter that we'd become beings of space and we'd lost our relationship to time. And so that's that's a very deep meditation. Since we're speaking of being in time, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I confess one of my favorite books is Sein und Zeit by Heidegger. Um, some people dislike it. I mean, some people have given that book nearly religious status. I'm not one of those people, although I admire a book written in poetry. I mean, Germans tend to write philosophy in two ways, you know, not essays like the like the like Anglo-Saxons. Germans write them as either sort of axioms or statements or poetry. Um, for me, even Nietzsche's thoughts are at his best when he's writing poetry. I mean, Thus Spake Zarathustra is a poetic novel. I mean, that's really the best way to, to look at it. And it's beautiful. You know, it doesn't mean you have to agree, but it's beautiful and the thoughts are challenging. But for me, Heidegger, I've got friends that get annoyed by that book because of course he's skirting around theology and won't actually answer theological questions because he doesn't feel a human being can go that far. Now, I've got some friends that really think that's an act of cowardice. And uh, why, why didn't he? Actually, I don't in an age like ours. I think to tease questions about being in time to the stage where the only formulation that comes after that must be theology is a major achievement. And I think that needs to be celebrated. I mean, I know Heidegger is, is, is celebrated, his work is celebrated. I know he can be a very problematic character, um, but yeah, that is, that is a major achievement. I mean, as I'm saying this, I'm also wondering if, if I'm managing to look increasingly like Albert Pike, um, because I think my cascading hair, that's why I sent you the question during the week, um, but it just does give me a certain similarity, which I'm rather pleased, pleased with. Um, so, yeah, so... I notice what, what, in a sense, Heidegger's worried about the thing we're worried about, that Steiner's worried about, Steiner's worried about. Um, 
this increasing battle against the human spirit, I'm one of those people that doesn't just lay down when I hear that there is no human self and there is no human self. Um, because now people want to say there's no consciousness, at least some people do, um, but, which is ridiculous. But, you know, the self thing, you know, it can be reduced into various propensities. They want to go down the Buddhist route, you know, the Upadana Skandas, the burning fires, where it seems you've got a permanent self, but it doesn't. No, no, there's a permanent self. I'm rather in the school of sort of Russian Russian writers and uh, Platonov. What was that book of his? The Irreducible Self. The fact that the concept of a human self, the concept that, uh, of human being is under such an attack at the moment is a real clue for me, not only that there's a great deal of depth and profundity and truth in that concept, but that's one of the things that various dark powers want to undermine. Um, yeah, I mean, I hate getting... Oh, I, I love meditating upon future worlds and happier times and, you know, one one huge hippie hug between the planets. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be lovely? You know, you know, incarnating between various worlds and just being beautiful. I, you know, I can really understand all that. Um, but we've got to, I think, confess that there are dark forces against humanity at the moment, many of which are not, not simply human. Um, and the one that worries me, I think, slightly more than Ariman. Ariman is now on the verge of riding roughshod over Western civilization, which I can't believe is happening, but it's happening around us. Uh, the one that's allowing that to occur is Lucifer, um, as the Lord of Delusions, the Lord of Fantasies. You know, it, 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 the Anglophone world, the youth of the Anglophone world. <laughs> You know, I don't mind fantasy novels. I rather like them. I like. There's nothing wrong with a bit of escapism. But surely everything in moderation, or at least everything in balance, when you give over, uh, you know, your entire free time to either Xboxes and computer games, or role play, or Marvel movies, or comics. I mean, there is real. There are real problems. I mean, if we're looking at, you know, in what way then, Vicka? Well, I'll tell you what, one way, I mean, if you're looking at the international tests, academic test scores, China's on the way up with their ruthless educational program, where kids uh, that are basically in secondary school are scoring results that basic uh, new, new undergraduates can't do in this part of the world. You know, the sciences are pushed in Chinese schools and academies on a daily basis these kids get up at five in the morning and they're working till nine in the evening and their test scores beggar uh, the, the Western world. And all that is coming in our direction. And what are we going to do? We're going to have a couple of jocks in Harvard talking about which superhero they are. You know, and I noticed Marvel itself. I don't believe that's just an industry because I don't think anything's neutral. We're in a, a war. We're in a war zone. We're caught between two worlds, much bigger and much more complex than our own. One is called the world of light and the other is called the world of darkness. And we are in, literally in a no man's land. We're caught between these warring spheres and we need to wake up to that fact very quickly. And unless we gravitate naturally towards a, a place we don't want to be. <clears throat> so, you know. Uh, I know. I don't think there's anything neutral in these huge corporations. Corporations are never neutral. Um, you don't earn huge investments and you don't recuperate your losses if you're neutral. I notice now they've started wishing Islam, Islam complimentary, you know, a nod to Islam, happy Eid, and so on. And now there, there's, uh, at least in Britain, there's there's a trailer going around. There's a young Islamic girl who spends too much time in fantasy, I quote, and the local mullah is basically having a go at her in the beginning of this trailer in the mosque, basically saying what any sensible adult would do. Look, you've got a life to lead, love, but you've got exams to prepare for. And he's the bad guy. And then she turns into some sort of half-assed superhero 
No, darling, it's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. You know, and fantasies are not on the same level as the might and beauty of Islam. I'm sorry. So I, I think it's sinister. I think Marvel thinks Christianity is basically finished. Um, I notice it never never mentions Judaism at all because that, that's too, you know, that's crushed. So we're, we're next. Um, and Marvel, you know, and now Islam's on the hit list. Um, and why? Why? Because dark forces want people to spend their lives in in small rooms on little machines, fantasizing their lives away, and it, it, it's a huge worry to me, um, because you know other parts of the world are not going down that route. And personally, I don't want to live in this sort of terrifying global civilization run by China where there are no human rights and everything's decided by a soulless party uh, who you have no representation within. I mean, the irony of people, I mean, they don't so much now, wearing working men's suits, working men's clothes, and saying they're, they're on the side of the working man, the working woman, when they have no contact with ordinary people whatsoever. I notice the present lot are all wearing Armani, um, and they've all got holiday homes across Europe. So much for socialism. You know, we, we, we've got to look at those parts of the world which haven't somehow been crushed by leisure time. And, you know, we need more leisure time, not less, <clears throat> but not leisure time to just get drunk and just lapse into fantasy and just forget that we're human beings that are multifaceted. You know, as I say, I, I like fantasy novels. I think they're in, imaginative, they're clever, and they explore worlds which don't have to be there to be interesting. But that's not what's going on with these corporations. And these corporations at least are being tempted by dark powers. And at worst, they're instruments of these dark powers, consciously or not. <clears throat> and we've got to start asking, well, OK, if that's true in entertainment, where else is it true? And you end up with very disturbing results. You know, Ziggy Marley, Bob Marley's, what was it, son, grandson? There's a war going on between right and wrong. Can you feel it? I can feel it, baby. And if we don't start to feel it in a much more realistic way, we will be victims to it. The, I don't think those spiritual energies naturally coalesce well. I think they're against each other. One of the saving graces is that Ariman and Lucifer are also at war. They, they, they don't represent... Uh, a pact of evil. I mean, I think they're helping each other at the minute, but I think that's sort of more or less accidental. Um, but it's basically Lucifer that lures you into a false sense of security, which, of course, is an illusion. Um, and that's when Araman can do his absolute best to just crush, destroy, maim and hurt, which is all down the road, just a little way if we're not careful. If we don't start defending concepts of the self, concepts of human being, being a human, my trouble with trans transhumanism um, isn't uh, like our friend Leo's, um, who, and he's an expert. I'm not attacking Leo. But I, I, I think sometimes people get a little carried away. I mean, certainly the level of tech that's being described isn't in the public domain. And I know Leo has contacts everywhere. I do not. I can only know what, what people are saying in the public domain and possibilities based on that. Um, therefore, what ha you know, what is transhumanism in the public domain? It's basically funding declarations and a lot of sci-fi. Um, the intent behind it is demonic, nevertheless. It doesn't have to be. I mean, certain parts of AI have been helping in medicine for decades now. Certain types of AI can help raise us out of the uh, third world poverty. That can actually be alleviated. We can be raised out of alienation. We can be raised out of ennui. I mean, that the, the, there is a paradise if it's used properly that it will help to facilitate. Facilitate, excuse me. Um, but we've also got to be aware that it's the enemy, uh, as it stands at the moment, of being human. I wish, uh, before we look at what comes after human, uh, we could try and become human before we get there. Because if we try to become human, maybe our solutions, maybe our thoughts about what comes next 
will actually be quite different. What do you think, John? Well, I think uh, in keeping with what you're sharing with us, it brings to mind uh, the World Economic Forum uh, Chief Advisor uh, Yuval Noah Harari. And he, he advocates uh, an antivirus for the brain, which could I, hypothetically prevent a person from falling victim to fake news. And oh, by the way, when he's referring to fake news, he proceeds on and says, you know, like the Bible. You know, it's like the Bible's fake news. So, yeah, that you, we're dealing with something that that is very, very dark. And when you consider, you know, the role of that whole constellation of characters, what they really are wishing to accomplish is to just lock us down within a, a realm devoid of spirit and soul. Yeah, and just f fall crashing into pure materialism. But yet to get to understanding uh, the reality of the universe itself, uh, Rudolf Steiner says, but when we come to spiritual science, we have to ask, is this relationship really so commonplace as the present day scientific conception of the world imagines? This modern scientific conception of the world examines the physical qualities of everything on earth, living and lifeless. It also investigates the stars, the sun, the moon, etc., and it discovers, indeed it is particularly proud of the discovery that these heavenly bodies are fundamentally of the same nature as the earth. I read that earlier, I'm reading it again because it ties directly into what you're talking about. And it continues, such a conception can only result from a form of knowledge which at no point comes to a real grasp of man himself, a knowledge which takes hold only of what is external to man. The moment, however, we really take hold of man as he stands within the universe, we become able to discover the relationships between the several instrumental members of man's nature, the physical body, the etheric body, and the astral body, and the corresponding entities, the cor corresponding realities of being in the cosmos. In regard to the etheric body of man, we find spread out in the cosmos the universal ether. The etheric body of man is a definite human shape, definite forms of movement within it, and so on. These are, it is true, are different in the cosmic ether. Nevertheless, the cosmic ether is fundamentally of like nature with what we find in the human etheric body. In the same way, we can speak of a similarity between what is found in the human astral body and a certain astral principle that works through all things and all beings out in the far spread universe. And so you're looking at this and you're seeing that, that Rudolf Steiner is making the point that it's because of the unique nature of Earth evolution whereby we've made the fall so that we have this material existence that that's the way we view the universe. But that's not the case, really. In looking at it from the standpoint of occultism, we see that this is our fourth stage. And when we look out to the stars, what we're seeing is, is really doorways into the astral. And when we look out into space, you see the blue of the sky. That is a representation of the reality of the etheric world. And so that this, this inner penetration of the astral into the etheric, that's a reality. Our experience of our physical nature, according to spiritual science, because of the fallen state of mankind, is illusory. So it's not, it's not a reality in the same uh, point of reference as the etheric and the astral. And so ultimately, as we move towards 
the end of Earth evolution, those that are following wholesome evolution, the, the physical nature of man becomes transformed through the mystery of the Philosopher's Stone, as it's referred to, in which we will eventually uh, become, uh, and Rudolf Steiner describes it as transparent fluid diamonds, and that that's the resurrection body. And, and so you have that represented by Christ himself in going through the death and the resurrection, so that he archetypally manifested the being and destiny of mankind so that earth evolution could be saved so that mankind could reach that lofty goal and so when you have this understanding you have to be able to to enter into it with the proper mood of soul and that's a key to understanding the tongues of flame and the language of all things that the apostles could speak after reading receiving the the uh inspiration of the, of the holy spirit and so if you look into that and what does it represent you see that Rudolf steiner says that the the abstract intellect is a result of fear and it's attempting to find an explanation for things through the world of the senses because mankind evolved to a state to where they could no longer clairvoyantly see into the astral or or the, the etheric realms that those were states of being of earlier uh, stages of, of mankind's evolution and so as we've fallen to this state to where we can only perceive in the life of the senses we have to make a provision for the realms of soul and spirit so that we can receive uh, the gifts uh, from that realm, the gifts of the spirit, right? And Rito Steiner says that the, the mystery of uh, the ascension has to do with kind of an admonition of, uh, it's, it reminds one of what would have happened had uh, Christ not taken on that great sacrifice in uh, the mystery of Golgotha. And, but on the other hand, that the, the mystery of Pentecost has to do with the awakening of one's relationship to the Christ. And he said, he shall be with you always. And, but that this is something that would work within you as you dedicate yourself to, to Christ in your consciousness, in your waking state, when you go to sleep, you go undergo a transformation. And of course, the, the, the greatest uh, vehicle that we've given to be able to uh, move towards that is the Lord's Prayer. And within the Lord's Prayer is encoded the whole uh, being and destiny of man. I, I, it's very hard to follow that. Um... Yeah, I'm, I, I'm aware of the work of Harari. Is that his name? Um, he wrote Homo Sapiens, of course, that international bestseller. Um, and I believe there was a documentary that went with it where you have all these evocative photographs of people around the world in different climates and different environments. And it's meant to be, there's a great irony in that project. It's meant to be a sort of magisterial presentation of the human spirit of what it means to be human um which simply cannot be the case if you keep an eye on what he's saying um the man is a monster basically um i hadn't heard the one you've just mentioned i certainly heard that he thinks things like liberty and truth need to be readdressed in our time and they need to be reassessed as for their usefulness and practicability. Well, uh, I'm sorry, that type of fascism, like the World Health Organization, and that type of fascism. Um, oh, he wrote Homer Deus as well. Right? I, I didn't come across that one, Oswald. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it. Um, and th there's an irony in that if he wrote a book with that title. Um, <coughs> you know, oh gosh, where was I? Yeah, I mean, anyone. 
Yeah, I rather like Huxley. Huxley wouldn't have been guilty of any of that. Um, I'm assuming, yeah, I don't go down the route that there are insiders and outsiders as novelists. I don't go down the route um, where they're all plotting against us. I think that's just bollocks. Um, anyone that knows anything about George Orwell knows he was a British socialist who absolutely hated the sort of world he was talking about in 1984. What world was he talking about? He was talking about Stalinist Russia, which is why he was on the KGB's hit list. Um, Aldous Huxley was a visionary who wanted to get back to some sort of weird Hindu way of life. I mean, yes, he wrote Brave New World. He also wrote a novel called The Island, Island, which is meant to be the curative way of dealing with Brave New World, where we all go and live in meditation you know, oh, what a wonderful idea. You know, it's not going to happen, but, you know, he, he's very clear about why that's a dystopia and what we should do about it. So I don't go for all that. I think there are great insights in conspiracy theories, in conspiracy theorists. That isn't one of them. Um, and conspiracy theorists let themselves down very severely when they haven't done the reading to support what they're saying. I mean, there's a guy on... John. Well, I think, we're, you know... If you look at uh, Harari, uh, to me, he's more, when you say uh, that Huxley is Harari's hero, well, yeah, especially Julian Huxley. See, the, the, it's, a, it's a big family, but they, they nonetheless are a part of that whole uh, group out of Britain with, that ties into uh, Charles Darwin and and that whole uh, scientific materialism, you know, and so you get into the whole Mal Malthusian uh, way of thinking that, that they're, they're saying like, oh, we have to do this because see, there's not enough to go around, and so we got to get rid of some people, you know, that that kind of uh, Ma Machiavellian Malthusianism. Malthusianism, that's a mouthful. And so yeah, you have that. And, and Julian Huxley is a big example, but he's, that's coming out of that, that specific group. And that's, that's a very uh, real thing. And also your friend over at University College London, the guy, the corpse sitting in the lobby, uh, what's his name? He's, he's another piece of work. And so you have some pretty profoundly uh, materialistic thinkers, and uh, but Aldous Huxley's not one of them. But nonetheless, he can't help it because he's he's a, a very sophisticated, abstract thinker. And I ran into that in my conversations with uh, uh, hold on, with Timothy Leary. Here you had a guy with brilliant mind, but he is encumbered with this whole scientific model of the universe. And to think that, just let's just look at memory. Uh, okay, so you think memory is like something that's like inside your brain or something? I mean, try to think that thought. That's absolutely absurd. When you see the whole concept of cosmic memory and and that it's the etheric body that's carrying these memories uh, for you and that it's a tableau so to speak and and that you can you can think back to when you were a child and remember playing with a butterfly fly in a field and see it in your mind and uh, so that there's something very real there but it's not dependent on chemical processes that's just merely the instrument. That's like saying that your microscope is responsible for something other than what it's what it's doing as a passive instrument. And and it's easy to allow uh, the thinking to go down this path again because it's fear based to wanting to find closure. You know, it's like greatest fear is fear of the unknown. And so by getting closure, we get rid of the unknowns. Huh? We're safe, you know. And it's, it's, it, it, 
is its own result. And so you can't possibly uh, really think it through and just use abstract thinking. And that, that's, that's, that's the rub right there, you know? Uh, I mean, geez, look at Stuart Mill. He's, he is probably one of the most developed examples of an attempt to try and, and abstractly think it through. But yet they don't uh, embrace many of the conclusions that he came to in his uh, elaborations on uh, the uh, democracy in America by, by uh, de Tocqueville, to where he realized that it was healthy to give expression to liberty because it increased creativity and you you gained a great deal from that but what do they want to do they they want to do the opposite of that so their concern is with power it's not with fostering the wholesome development of mankind it's a very very different destiny um not all conspiracy theorists are well read like you mr barnwell and not all conspiracy theorists have had an illustrious background like you. Um, certainly, I reject the idea in the case of Darwin. Darwin was a Unitarian, not a scientific materialist. The Darwin family uh, used to hold soirees on a monthly basis, holding British druids, radical poets, meditation circles, Hindu pundits as part of their circle of bohemian uh, experimentation. I th you know, we've got to be careful of divorcing being from time or you end up with caricatures. Um, Julian Huxley, yes, I do take that as, as a link and a possible example amongst the Huxleys. And the Huxleys as a family represented scientific progress. All of them disagree about what that means. Um, and I think if you put Julian Huxley in the modern world, and asked him, what do you think of these set of circumstances? Not only would he not be able to un understand them, he'd actually reject them. You know, we, we get caricatures of people and their positions by forgetting they belong to a particular time frame. And certainly in the case of the Darwins, you know, the intellectual aristocracy, as it's called in, in Britain, the Tates, the Wedgwoods, um, they spent fortunes raising this country out of uh, out of the mire. I mean, the, the landed gentry, as usual, keep their hands in their pockets and never spend a penny on social betterment. It was true then as it's true now. What these merchants did, what these mercantile families did uh, in their need to raise themselves out of the merely mercantile, if there's anything mere in mercantilism, um, was actually create whole cultural worlds. Um, and certainly, you know, I mean, Darwin, I gave a, on the centenary, I actually gave a talk, it was so long ago, I can't remember where at the minute. But I mean, it was one of his uncles, who was a Unitarian minister, who used to read extracts of Origin of Species from his pulpit, and say it was an insight into the workings of nature. I mean, even the Vatican recently, actually said it did make a contribution to our understanding of the way life works. I mean, you know, we, we've got to be careful of, of the illusion of false information and false facts um, and not being careful enough with their origin and their historical context. Um, so the Darwin always gets up my nose. But, you know, why didn't he go to Anglican church with his wife every Sunday? Was it because he was an atheist? No, it's because he wasn't an Anglican, period, the end. Um, you know, and towards the end of his life, they're trying to pin him down on, OK, what do you actually think, Charles? And he doesn't want to go along with it because he realises in that time frame and in that zeitgeist, it w won't do his work any favours to suddenly, suddenly start talking about a, a personal theos or an impersonal theos. That simply wouldn't, wouldn't be where he was going. And by that time, his arguments were being used by everybody under the sun to basically carve up academia anyway. So Darwin always gets up my nose uh, as an example, because I know what the family themselves were doing. You know, trying to sing ancient Celtic hymns with your local druids isn't an example of scientific materialism. Um, yeah. 
And yeah, the Huxleys are a strange mob. I mean, I used to like reading Herbert Spencer. Um, Herbert Spencer, if you go to Highgate Cemetery, is buried directly across the way from Karl Marx. Now, that must make an interesting conversation when everybody leaves the cemetery at night. Um, you know, with, with, I think Darwin, I, I prefer Kropotkin if we're looking at the grim mechanics of nature and uh, the way that he wants to talk. And of course, Kropotkin had the resources and he did the, the traveling. And Mutual Aid is a masterpiece. I believe it was partly written as an objection to some of the Malthusian elements of Darwin's thesis. Um, and, you know, because he says, look, nature cooperates. Human, human, human beings need to cooperate. Look at animal societies. Look at insect societies. They're based on collaboration. Um, but it doesn't nullify what Darwin says. And if you look at the Huxleys, as I say, you know, they're all over the place. It's not one unified group attacking and assaulting the finer sensibilities of human nature. There's one guy on TikTok at the moment who's, I mean, he's obviously making a pitch to become a, a conspiracy theorist. I can't remember his name offhand. And it's just superficial garbage after superficial garbage. Why don't we all admit that the Anunnaki are just a fact? Why don't we admit that the Anunnaki were actually the ancient Greek gods and he's done over a hundred, well, oh, sorry, over 90 presentations now. So why aren't we taking him more seriously? I'll get you the name for next week. Uh, yeah, this is nonsensical. Um, why aren't we bowing down in homage to this guy? For the simple reason, you're talking bollocks. That's why. And most people will have the brain to realise that. You know, don't get me wrong. I think conspiracy theorists and conspiracy theories, some of them, are an incredible development on on cultural discourse we need to inquire into everything everything must stand the litmus test of inquiry otherwise it's not worth standing at all but we've got to be careful we're doing it in the right way and with the, the right level of precision or we end up with with false tools aiming at a false problem um back to you john i don't know what you want to say about that well yeah uh and that really you did you proved my point for me because see if if you dig deep into into what i've been trying to say for all these many months is it's the type of thinking that is being used that gives you the result that you get okay and so for example rudolf steiner was a great admirer of Charles Darwin, by the way. And don't forget, uh, Rudolf Steiner was considered, he would have been the protege of Ernst Haeckel, who is like the German uh, counterpart to Charles Darwin. Uh, but <laughs> then imagine Ernst Haeckel's surprise when all of a sudden Rudolf Steiner starts giving lectures on theosophy. He was like aghast, you know, because like, that's not what he's doing. And uh, Rudolf Steiner was very capable of wearing different hats. And, and But his reply to people questioning about that whole idea of the evolution of species and Darwinism and all of that, he said that the way in which to deal with these ideas is not to avoid them, but to take them up. And he, and he said, but take them up into the world of spirit in your sleep and allow uh, the spiritual world to respond. And he said that really his outline of occult science was the result of that particular process. He took the, the uh, morphology of Goethe and the evolutionary ideas of Ernst Haeckel and Darwin, all that, with him into the spiritual world and it, it provided the basis for a question of what is the real answer to this? And, and so we have this extremely uh, developed uh, presentation of the sevenfold scheme of planetary conditions. And so you see, there's value in these things, but even if it's just describing the reflection as a question and allowing the spiritual world 
to give you the inspiration to move towards uh, a greater understanding. And so that's that's the difficulty in dealing with this because people get defensive and say, well, you know, you're attacking science. No, I'm, I'm approaching it from a different perspective. And so you see that uh, in looking at this, it, it becomes a challenge. Uh, physical science, Rudolf Steiner says, physical science theorizes materialistically about the blue of the sky. And for physical science, it is indeed very difficult to reach any intelligent conclusion on this point for the simple reason that it is bound to admit that where we see the blue of the sky, there is nothing physical. Nevertheless, men spin out the most elaborate theories to explain how the rays of light are reflected and refracted in a particular way so as to call forth this blue of the sky. In reality, it is here that the supersensible world begins already to hold sway. In the cosmos, the supersensible does indeed become visible to us. We have only discovered where and how it becomes physical. Visible. The ether becomes perceptible to us through the blue in the sky. But now somewhere there is also present the astral element of the cosmos. In the blue sky, the ether peeps through, as it were, into the realms of sense. Where then does the astrality in the cosmos peer through into the realms of perceptibility? The answer, my dear friends, is this. Every star that we see glittering in the heavens is in reality a gate of entry for the astral. Whenever the stars are twinkling and glittering in toward us, there glitters and shines the astral. Look at the starry heavens in their manifold variety. In one part, the stars are gathered into heaps and clusters, or in another, they are scattered far apart. In all this wonderful configuration of radiant light, the invisible and supersensible astral body of the cosmos makes itself visible to us. For this reason, we must not consider the world of stars unspiritual. To look upon the world of stars and speak of worlds of burning gases is just as though, forgive the apparent absurdity of the comparison, but it's precisely too. It's just as though someone who loves you were gently stroking you, holding the fingers a little apart, and you were then to say it feels like so many ribbons being drawn across your cheek. And so you have that, that articulation of a partiality that leads us to the type of thinking of whether it's a Julian Huxley, Aldous Huxley, or any of these, you know, Ernst Haeckel, Charles Darwin. It's not that the, 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 the thoughts that they're thinking cannot be thought. It's just that as long as you understand that they're incomplete and that they're only taking into account the experience of the oppression of the senses and that they don't get behind the scene of events to where the action really is, which is the coming forth of being from the astral and etheric realms as they are perceived by the individual human ego, which is the reincarnating entity itself. And so it's not easy for many people to, to come to that understanding because uh, admittedly, they've been living in this abstract thinking in their whole life, and they've been force-fed the most banal uh, examples of it. You know, uh, watching television and and all this caricature. It's a it's a great caricature, and it's uh, it becomes uh, propaganda, essentially propaganda for materialism, and they they promote lifestyles that are really uh, expressions of animality. You know, it's, if you look at what, what are movies about? Well, it's about people killing each other and having sex. That's like most of the movies, right? Is that the best we could do? Really? <laughs> you know, so you have to admit that there's, there's kind of a shortfall in that department. And, and it's, it's tricky because uh, in getting close to these ideas was well, kind of like uh, what Tim Leary once said to me that that uh, caterpillars don't understand butterfly language 
and you know he was a he was a really bright guy, but yet he was a scientific guy. I me I remember we first called him me and uh, Robert and I from the Mayflower Bookshop. We called him up to, but we were thinking about bringing him into town because we used to bring in a lot of people into town to do uh, lectures or weekend retreat stuff, a lot of fun things. But so we called him up and we said, yeah, we, we'd like to talk to you about, you know, we, we bring in a lot of different spiritual people to, to give lectures. He says, I'm not spiritual, I'm scientific. <laughs> so, oh, okay. You know. So in other words, I mean, you know, when, when they arrested him, they submitted him to a body of tests, right? And the, the the psychiatrist giving him the test said, uh, "Dr. Leary, I feel kind of embarrassed giving you this test because you designed it." <laughs> you know, it's like so you have one of their main guys really is who he was, but then he 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 got off the reservation, so to speak, and it's that whole idea of that consciousness is some kind of biochemical event, and it and. In spiritual science, you would say, well, it's the chemistry doesn't create the uh, capacity that it, it's it's a vehicle, it's a tool, so that we are not our physical body, we are not our etheric body, we are not our astral body. We are our ego, which is that which is given to us through uh, like drops from from the, the nature of the Christ being, and that that is the eternal entity, so to speak, that goes through incarnations. And these other vehicles, it's like, you're not your automobile. Although some people, when you see them driving around, you could think that they thought, aren't I great? Look at the car I have, you know? And so it's it's kind of like that. And it's tricky because, you know, when you die, you, you that's not gonna drop away and you're gonna go get a different model, right? And so, uh, in coming to it from that that vantage point of the abstract scientific, it doesn't have a, an ability. It's it's a closed set, and you you need an open set. Like I said, on on numerous episodes, is that this whole idea of the open set? That because there has to be a provision for the re, the realms of soul and spirit. And that you cannot solve the riddle with just material abstract thinking. And so it's not it's not anything against uh, these people per se. They do the best that they could do with what they had, but that's was what they were working with. And so they're going to come up with an end result that is developed out of the fear of the unknown. I'll just start by saying I'm pleased Johnny Depp won. The trial, I can't stand Amber Heard, um, a liar and a gold digger. Take me to court, Amber. Um, so you know, I'm pleased Johnny won. Um, yeah, as I say, you know, it, it, but it's not even that. I mean, at the end of the day, Charles Darwin was a naturalist exploring naturalism. That was his passion. You know, most people are not hypsisterians. Most people of ability are not looking in all these different fields, sadly. Uh, that that gives me no joy saying that because we need balance. But you know what? What was jo Charles Darwin's passion? The natural order as an English naturalist. Uh, what was Aldous Huxley's? I don't want to speak about the others, the other Huxleys, because that raises all sorts of complications. Um, you know, I, I mean, he clearly was looking for spiritual realities. You know, the doors of perception are, are, are very clear. That's what he's trying to attain and you know the fact he had what was it a shot of lsd on his deathbed to try and falsely raise him into the nirvanic state as he passed over i mean that is for me that's a terrible sign of someone that hasn't understood the spiritual path but it's also a sign of someone that's looking seriously for the spiritual path so you know so we've got to be careful of We've got to be careful of broad brushstrokes, particularly when we're dealing with people of that calibre. That's that's what I'll say to that. Um, I said, you know, it's unusual, I suppose, that I've uh, looked in so many different fields. I mean, I know that's an unusual thing, like your good self. But, you know, what, what worries me is the fact this 
there's no real balance in things at the minute. And that's what we've got to achieve, you know, not the stamping out uh, uh, of a fantasy. That's not what anybody should be trying to do. Uh, in the hands of a master, fantasy is enlightening about the world we live in. Uh, but, you know, people can't live lives devoted to fantasy, uh, to anything apart from their own detriment. And that's not being shown clearly by anybody in any way at the minute. You know, the powers that be have almost abnegated all responsibility um, because they just don't want that. That shows some sort of social cohesion. They're now in the process of denying. I mean, another monster came to mind while we were actually talking. Have you heard of Ignatius Nartiev? Ignatius Ignatiev? I mean, he's going around talking about um, how he's looking forward to dancing around the bodies of the last white men <coughs> with his student. That's nearly a quote. Um, and he's teaching and researching race as, an, as a sociologist. I can't remember where. Why isn't that being challenged? Uh, you know, the, the, the present academy uh, is really becoming analogous to the medieval church. There's only one opinion that's permitted, and that is theirs. Any type of dissension and any type of other opinion is heresy and will be ridiculed uh, until it's no longer there, and those people will be persecuted. I mean, we're going back into a medieval structure without realising, you know, everybody's thinking of kings and queens and princes and looking cool, riding on horseback, um, and everybody sort of knowing their, their place in the social order. I find that thought offensive, but many people do not, because the assumption is in our deluded modern society that they'll all be aristocrats, they'll all be landed gentry. If the elite manage to pull this off, they're in for a really nasty surprise very, very soon. Um, you know, and therefore you've got the elite, the landed gentry. I mean, it's nearly the same names as in those days. If you look at the families, if you look at the descendants of those families, it's nearly the same group that were in power then. But you, you end up with an academy that's so-called that's now the church doing its best to brainwash in everybody into a certain type of ideology, at which is unassailable. You attack it and you question it at your peril. I mean, you know, you, you said earlier, what was it? Uh, you didn't mind questioning science. Good, because that's the scientific method. That's, you know, whatever happened to that? Not to question science ipso facto is not scientific. And that is beginning to creep into the system. So, OK, we've now got the landed gentry back with all their pomp, the billionaire class that care about nothing, um, apart from the plebs being kept in their place. Uh, and you've got their, their, their apologists, the medieval church back in the form of a reductionist materialist academy that will brook no, no, no dissension. Um, you know, and it now wants people uh, to study in the ways it's prescribing. I heard recently that a, uh, one of the colleges in the University of London not only prescribes the way it wants its doctoral students to conduct their research, then it's not research. Then it's not research. It also said to some of them in one of their meetings, I've got to be very careful with this because I don't want to upset people. Uh, it was said in one of the meetings for the new PhDs, we know it can be done other ways, but we don't want it done those ways. So, right, you're back with Torquemada and the Inquisition, you know, where the young priests are being trained to keep up the party line. And anything less than that means not only will you not, will you not get your qualification, you won't get your position in that particular hierarchy. I'll hand it back to you, John, because I can see you looking worriedly at the time. Well, yeah, it, it, again, they, they hate Christ. I mean, let's, let's be honest. They hate Christ, right? And so if they hate Christ, what does that mean? Well, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, and so they hate the way, they hate the truth, and they hate the life. So guess what? They're going to control the way, 
right? They're going to falsify the truth, and they're going to destroy the life. That's <laughs> that's basically the the cliff notes of 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 their agenda, and so in looking at that, that's more than a little disturbing. But again, I keep referring to this. The other day, I was talking to Douglas Gabriel from American Intelligence Media, my best buddy, and we were both commenting about how people read the book of Revelation, and they somehow never get to the good part. And that's that's the glorious ending, right? That's the, the, the glorious ending of those that are in the company of Christ. And it's it's a, kind of a sad thing because ultimately in, in achieving that goal, we come what Rudolf Steiner describes as freedom, Spirits of freedom and love. and But what's the alternative? And that you lose your, your stature through, of your participating in Christ. And so what, what happens? Well, you become basically an elemental being uh, of a group, soul-type nature. As it moves forward, you become a, a fallen, failed uh fourth principle being so you've you've lost your stature and you just are relegated to uh, really uh, the realm of the elementals essentially you become a part of a group nature rather than an individuated being and so you know but if you look at harari and guys like that that's what they're looking they want they want to develop a uh, a subnature based architecture of the hive mind right they they want to implant stuff in you so they can be the ones that determine your content and your output i mean it's like they're in other words they're crazy basically and uh if you think that that's a wholesome path Good luck with that, because that has to do with what would have happened had Christ not incarnated, that the earth would have basically just been a fallen, ultimately having the laws of entropy become the main thing going on uh, and not understanding the laws of levity or, or entropy that there's this, this raising up. And so mankind is, has the opportunity to be raised up in the kingdom uh, that is not of this world. And so with that being said, we're running out of time here. But we have so much fun talking. We're here with the prelate, Reverend David Wayne Perry. This is his first book. The Grammar of Witchcraft. It's a Shakespearean study. It's not a grimoire. It's not a how-to. And here's his Shakespearean esque poetry, Caliban's Redemption. And his major work is Mount Athos Inside Me, Essays on Religion, Swedenborg and the Arts, edited by Daniela Hadi Irendust, who, by the way, has a, a new book out, and I'm going to mention that. Give him a a shout out if I can figure out where it is. I always got so many things going on here that it's not always easy to keep track of everything. Uh, oh, that's the wrong page. Sorry about that, but I can. Uh, here it is. Uh, it's called On the Philosophy of Education Towards an Anthroposophical View by Daniela Hadi Irinduced. And uh, I put a link below you can, so you can check out the Kindle edition for free or you can order it in paperback. That's the Amazon link. And uh, Reverend David's books are also, the link is below. And uh, you can check them out on Amazon. As for myself, 
My first book is The Arcana of the Grail Angel. That's some 640 pages and it has a forward by Douglas Gabriel of American Intelligence Media with extensive diagrams and bibliography. The diagrams are based on the handwritten diagrams of Aaron Fred Pfeiffer, the direct student of Rudolf Steiner, across my desk many years ago. And so we have a lot of these laid out here. Plus, I added a great many more uh, in my second volume, which is Arcana of Light on the Path, with a forward by the noted astrosopher and psychologist uh, William Bento. Good old Willie, who passed away a few years ago. My books are available in the continental US on eBay. And uh, if you're outside the US, you can contact me directly through my academia link below, or you can contact me by private message on Facebook and I can make arrangements for you to be able to receive the books. Uh, also, I want to uh, give a mention that uh, this podcast has been made possible by the generous support of Tyla, Vadim, Vivian, Neil, Christian, Mark, Maude, Dhruvman, Laura, Paula, Rick, Michael, Beth, Istar, and so many others over the year. I want to thank you all for supporting our humble efforts. And uh, want to buy us a cup of coffee? Uh, well, for Reverend David, it's paypal.me forward slash dperry777. And for myself, it's paypal.me forward slash johnbarnwell888. And uh, in advance, I want to thank you all for showing up. And I hope that uh, we can get Reverend David here now to consecrate our efforts on this wonderful Pentecost of 2022. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of the time. Um, and there's so much to say about Pentecost that I'm, I'm beggar for words. Um, my friends, it's been a great pleasure spending time with you all again. It's been a great pleasure meeting my, my huge friend, John Barnwell, again. It's ever more important from, from me, from my perspective, from my own meditations and prayers, that if we're to really combat the dark powers that are increasingly physically, spiritually, and obviously against us, that we meditate and understand our own place in time. Where are we? When are we? Because only that will really allow us to delve ever more deeply into the mysteries of our being as human beings. Because at that point, I firmly believe, along with the majority of the churches, that the Christ impulse will descend upon us and into our lives in an appropriate way to raise us up to the kingdom of light and beauty beyond all of the vicissitudes of this passing world. My friend, God, my friends, God bless you all until next week. Amen. Well, once again, thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for stopping by. And for those that are watching the rebroadcast in the coming future, uh, may you have a great Pentecost. <laughs>